Hey, Phil, it's, uh, it's Dennis Gray from the Australian Rock Show. How are you? I'm all right. How are you doing? I'm very, very well. Okay, let's rip straight into it and talk about the new album, The Missing Piece. Really raw sound overall, I think. And importantly for me, anyway, the album sounds really, really fresh. I, I imagine you're satisfied with the finished result? Yeah, um, I am actually. I think we all uh, are happy with the way it turned out. Although when we were making it, um, we were all pretty confident about the way it was sounding and the way it was coming together. Mm. So it was just nice. It was a nice uh, confirmation when it came out and people reacted, um, as we hoped they would, as we did when we were making it. And uh, yeah, you know, it's a good record. It... it uh, it covers a lot of spectrums. You said it was raw, mm. um, and 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 elements of it are. Some of like speed is 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 is, is very raw. Um, Bleach, mm. um, sticky fingers are all really raw tracks. And was the other adjective you used uh, classic? Um, there's lots of that too. Like more towards like the end of it. Um, Missing piece gave it all away. Um, really sort of going for that big, full, sort of 80s production um, sound and, and basically trying to make a uh, well-rounded record um, that wouldn't be boring, it wouldn't be too one-dimensional. You know, didn't, nothing against bands like ACDC or Motorhead, you know, they're really good at what they do. They do one thing, they do it really, really well. Um, we're not like that. We, uh, we like trying different sounds, Try on different outfits, if you will, mm. different hats. See what fits. See what works. <laughs> see what we like, and and it makes it, it makes it a lot more interesting as a player. And uh, it couldn't hurt um, to be uh, a, a, a a follower as well, because it's interesting. It's always interesting. Well, it's interesting you mentioned the first single, "Speed." That's the track we have kicked this show off with, and I really, really love that tune. Again. Uh, you know, I, I think it's allowed 80s rawness to it, but the lyrics are very, very cool too. Stuff like, um, she's going to drink a lot of gasoline. You know, I'm living in a V8 dream. A little speed will make you want a little more. One listen to that, mm -hmm. and I wanted to hear a little more of the album. What's the story behind that track, Speed? Just, uh, that was one of the first ones. Um, that was, uh, that one really jumped out that that, that was going to be, um, that was going to get people's attention. Um, it just, uh, you know, an homage to, to, to the, to the automobile, I guess, you know, a, uh, a song about, you know, just driving fast and, and, mm. um, n nothing more to it. There, 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 there's no hidden meaning. There's no double entendre. It's all, you know, it is what it is. And apart from the, the nod to, to, um, Deep Purple, of course. Mm. Um, it, it, we, we, we took a line from Highway Star, just the line, and, um, and, and and popped it in our song, and it worked really well. Is it a challenge, Phil, after so many years of writing songs to come up with lyrics, which I guess not only fit the tune, but lyrics that you are completely content with? It's always a challenge, you know, always has been, always will be, you know, it... it, it uh, the trick is to, to make it sound easy, to make it, you know, Tom Petty was always so good at that, you know, like, it's, mm -hmm. oh, I could write one of those songs, could do that in five minutes. And, and, and you kind of get that, you know, and, and uh, uh, I, I want, that's, that's very much how I want it to be. I want people to listen to it and go, yeah, I could do that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Even though they probably couldn't because, because it um, takes a, a tremendous amount of skill and concentration um, but, um, it, it, it's, uh, I, I, yeah, it's still a challenge, but it's still fun and, and it's still, still great when it comes out, when it sounds good, when it's the, the final, you hear the final product and you go, yeah, yeah, I pulled it off. We did it. And that's always a good feeling. Mate, I want to dig into your background a little, if I can. Am I correct in assuming you grew up around the Croydon area in Surrey and what bands were you seeing growing up in that area? Um, well, I went to, I grew up in London. I was born in London, but you know, Croydon pretty much is London. Mm. You know, when mm -hmm. I was a kid, it was like all, all the way to Croydon when in fact it's, it's only something like 25 miles. Mm. Um, but yeah, I, I did, uh, music played a huge, huge part of my school life. 
Um, I had a record player. I'd collect records. I'd come home on weekends um, and I'd go down the markets and I'd buy um, LPs and uh, I'd bring them back to school and sell them. <laughs> Make mm. lots of money. And, and um, before I knew it, I had my, my, a thriving little record business going. Um, at the ripe old age of 15. Um, and, uh, yeah, bands I was listening to were, you know, the classics, uh, Red Zeppelin, Deep Purple, Black Sabbath, and then there were other bands, you know, the, the Humble Pie, Groundhogs, Heavy Metal Kids, uh, that band Focus, was huge mm. when I was a kid, um, T-Rex, of course, but you kind of kept that on the DL. You didn't really want your mates to know you were a T-Rex fan because that was kind of girls' music, but, mm. uh, um, the, the, you know, T-Rex, a uh, Mark Bowen concert was something to behold, to me tell you. It was just absolutely amazing. Um, and, oh, God, you know, Alex Hall, I'm, I'm sure there's, there's tons I've missed. I listened to a lot of um, uh, Moody Blues, um, Free, of course. Oh, my God, I love band, uh, that, that band, Free, Paul Rogers mm. and Simon Kirk and those guys. Um, and then... Um, as I got a little older and, and got a little more sophisticated in my taste, I started to discover bands like Roxy Music and Ian Jury and um, um, oh, I can't remember the other guy's name, but yeah, you know, yeah, Bowie, of course. Um, um, and, 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 and got more into the sort of experimental. I, I, I left the, 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 you know, the straightforward R&B, the, 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 blue, the blue stuff. And, and got in, into more sort of ambient, um, sexy music, I guess. <laughs> mm, mm. Did the New York Dolls and, I guess, Johnny Thunder influence you back then? They made me laugh. They <laughs> they, always, they always gave me a good laugh. They I, I thought they were the shittiest band I ever saw in my life. I saw them and I, I really, you know, I got it. I got what people were, were um, excited about. Um, they were funny looking. That, there's no doubt about that. They were really um, enigmatic, and, and it, it was something to see. But oh my God, they stank. And I don't know if that was part of the deal. You know, debatably, they could have been the first punk rock band ever. Um, and may, maybe I just didn't get it. But boy, they were just—it was terrible. It was like you know, they were all over the place. Um, and it's too bad because they were all good players. Um, Arthur Kane was a good bass player. Johnny Fond was a great little guitar player, but um, all combined, David Johansson was a good singer, but all combined, it was just utter garbage. It was it was something that I saw in, in disbelief. But then again, um, first show that I ever saw, uh, well, the first show that the Stranglers ever did in London, I had the misfortune to be at as well. And they mm. were absolutely awful as well. And, and, and they went on to become huge, especially in England, enormous. Um, and uh, shot me right up there. But the, the dolls, no, they never could do it. They never pulled it off. And, and it was just, I don't know. I mean, if you thought Kiss was bad and you see New York Dolls, it's like, Christ, how could it, anything be worse than Kiss? But believe it or not, there it is. Well, so, yeah, Phil, influence, right... an influence, but not a good one. Okay, right off the bat, I've got to confess that, although I'm meant to be chatting about the new album, The Missing Piece, um, back Back in the day, I bought and owned Girls She Agreed record and played that thing a lot. And I know that it peaked at number 33 in the UK album charts. Did that surprise you that it got to 33 in the UK charts? Oh, everything about it surprised me. You know, the fact that we got a record deal, the fact that, you know, we went on tour. I mean, I, I couldn't believe it that, that you know, we were, were getting away with murder. You know, we were taking, um, we were taking Johnny Rotten's um, career counseling. <laughs> <laughs> uh, to heart and, and uh, yeah, you know, it was it was uh, it was amazing. It was fun. Um, you know, it's funny because you bring up New York Dolls and and Girl was such a um, like a parody of of New York Dolls in 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 many ways. But I don't know something. You know, as 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 bad as as, as Girl were, I don't think we were as bad as New York Dolls. Um, <laughs> You know, there were bands that were formed around that time, late mm. 70s, part of that new wave of British heavy metal and Def Leppard, Iron Maiden, Praying Man. It's a bunch of different bands, lots of different bands, actually. And and some of them were, you know, went on to do amazing 
stuff. Iron Maiden, of course, Def Leppard, of course. And um, each record was, you know, like a, a, another um, a bound um, masterpiece, you know, like a, a, a part of a of an ongoing ongoing um, series, like a, a mm-hmm. like a, a Hobbit or something like that, you know, Hobbit or you know, it's a, a band that developed and changed and and when um, had had you know lots of different. Um, basically history um girl was a two-page poem you know it was it was something that wasn't really designed to last a long time and it didn't last a long time it was two years from beginning to end and it was a it was great great fun two years i really loved it but it was kind of a relief when it was all over to be honest if girl had made it like say motley crew or, or Def Leppard, and, and I was still stuck doing that with those guys right now. I'd be miserable, to be honest. <laughs> mm, mm. Was that um, was it the label's idea? I think Jet Jet Records to record Kisses. Do you love me? Uh, no, that was, well. I mean, it was it, that was the label that we were signed and and signed to, um, mm. and um, you know Don Arden had uh, um, ELO at the time, Electric Light Orchestra at the time. He had Gary Moore. It just got an Aussie. They had a nice little label going. Um, Kim Fowley called me uh, in London, tracked me down, called me at the the uh, at the office at the the, the the record company, who wrote the song, and and he was like, "Oh, you got you guys have got to do this song. It's going to absolutely put you guys over the top." And and I, I couldn't help but agree with him. It, it it was it was something you know I didn't know Kiss that well. Um, you know, as I said, I was more into sort of like Deep Purple and Humble Pie and Led Zeppelin. So, so um, you know, Kiss were kind of like 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 a pantomime group for me. You know, growing up, I never really took them seriously. But um, in in the con- in the context of, of Girl, I thought that Do You Love Me work would work really really well. And we didn't have that many songs at the time, so I was like, Yeah, all right, we'll try it, see how it goes. Um, it cut to like a year later. Um, we've got dates with Kiss, the, the mighty Kiss. We've got like three shows in London, two shows in London, and one up in Birmingham. And um, as I said, we didn't really have many songs, so we put it in our set. We put "Do You Love Me" in our set, and 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 Gene was livid. It was flipping out. As soon as we came off stage, I was one of the security guys grabbed me and he goes, "Gene wants to talk to you right away." And called me into his dressing room, and he's looking at me through his mirror while he's doing his makeup. And he goes, well, "This is this is very bad form, Philip. This cannot happen again." And uh, you know, I, I was like, "Oh yeah, well, all right." But you know, they didn't even put it; they didn't have it in their set. So I figured mm-hmm. it would be all right. Um, you know, it wasn't like we were doing Detroit Rock City or something. You know, it was kind of a deep cut. It, you know, it was just like our songs are like children, like our children, Philip. And I was like, well, Gene, with respect, it's not your song. It's it's Kim Fowley's song. And it was, it's, it's like, uh, it didn't go very well. Kicked off the uh, Kiss Tour for performing Do You Love Me? Maybe that's a that's a book title somewhere along the line. But Well, it's so, true. I mean, that's what happened. We did, you know, because we did it again the second night, and that was it. We got the old heap out, so fuck it. So you moved to L.A. kind of late, I, I guess, at, at around 30 years of age. I'm assuming you were fairly confident of good things ahead back then. No, no, I wasn't actually. I was, I was uh, distraught, and, and uh, the London music scene had actually ground to a halt. Um, mm. I was in a band with Bernie Torme, and we were just blowing off the roof of, the, of places every night. But we just couldn't get a record deal because they were after Hazy Fantasy. They wanted Thompson Twins, you know. They wanted, mm, yeah. you know, like good, clean family music. And and I, I, I honestly believe that if Guns N' Roses had been in London around the same time, 85, 6, 7, I don't think they would have got signed by an English label either. It was absolutely dreadful. It was, it was just such a a miserable time to be a rock musician in England. And uh, so it was, you know, I've got to get the fuck out of here. This is dead, you know. Mm. This is, this is. if I don't do something, um, I've got to, I'm going to go crazy. So, yeah, so I did um, come out kind of late, but I've been coming out to L.A., a lot prior to moving mm. out in 86 and 87. So I was familiar with it. 
Um, and and it just at that point, you know, when I got a call from Tracy saying, you know, Paul Black wasn't working out because of his heroin problem, and you know, needed a singer, and and it was a it was a great scene happening out here, and it was the, I jumped at the chance, and and it was it was really good. It was it was a new life, and uh, I don't regret it at all. I reckon if fans want to know a bit about your pedigree, and indeed what music makes Phil Lewis tick, they should get a hold of that 2004 album, Rips the Covers Off. Some wonderful interpretations on there. Muddy Waters, Hanoi Rocks, Zepp, Aerosmith, Stooges, Queen, Saxons, Wheel of Steel, some Bowie and ripping takes of both Rose Tattoo and The Angels. How did The Angels and Rose Tattoo come onto your radar? Oh, my God. I was a huge fan of theirs um, when I was a kid growing up in London. Hmm. Um, uh, I saw... Um, Angel City, as we called them, you called them the Angels, open for Cheap Trick um, at Hammersmith Odeon. It's just absolutely blown away. Just so, so cool. Mm. And got their album and, and absolutely lived up to everything that their um, live show did. Um, and um, loved them. And, and then Rose Tattoo is another one of those bands. You know, I just you just hear it once. And it's just like it's infectious. It's immediate, yeah. and, and 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 I just loved them. And um, so I, we've always, I've been doing um, rock and roll outlaw live in my set uh, in various different bands for a long time. So um, it was it was a no brainer putting it on rips the covers off. I wanted it, the cover record to be diverse. I, I didn't want it to be, you know, all the corny, all the stuff that, you know, has all mm. been heard a million times before. A little bit with the Bowie stuff, but it's only because I've been doing that song for so long that, you know, I just knew I could nail it. But as as far as um, the, the uh, it was really good to add a couple of Aussie bands uh, on that record and maybe um, expose them to people um, that might not no, just 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 what a great, amazing scene Australia has, and and it didn't stop there. I mean, I I, I still listen to Australian bands. I I, I love Jet. Um, I love it's just it's something about you guys. You got the the, the rock and roll thing down, down there. <laughs> Mate, I want to quickly touch on your relationship with Tracy Guns. Now, this new album, of course, as most fans know, is your first with Tracy in um, about fifteen years. Now, some yeah. time back, Tracy recently said to LA Weekly, when you put Phil and I together, that's the sound of LA Guns. There's no way around that. I also read an accurate comment and line from a fan referencing you and Tracy saying, they just perform better, play better, and write better when they're together. These comments summarize so much about your rock and roll partnership, doesn't it? How would you describe the chemistry which you have with Tracy? Well, there it is. That's the word you used, it, chemistry. That, that's mm. exactly what it is. You know, I, I played with a lot of different guitar players, a lot of different musicians. Um, but there's something about when we play together and him, he, he and I play together, he makes me work hard. He makes me work a little bit harder than most people. He makes me, you know, I, I end up rehearsing longer later. I end up hitting higher notes than I might do with anyone else. It's, it's an interesting thing. It just it's just we have a it, it, it's 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 not a rivalry, um, but it's just like what can I? I'm going to do something. I'm going to blow him away now. What does you know? It's always trying to always we're always trying to do better than than we've already done. And you know, in, in terms of our, our songwriting and and our, and our shows, our, our live shows, you know, we always want to always want it to be a little bit better you know we always go up with that attitude this this might be the last time we ever play so it's going to be the best best show we've ever done in our lives and 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 we do that and you know things have been going since this reunion they've been going very well and and uh 99 of the shows have been sold out but every now and then you know we might be in the middle of a week in the middle of a tour somewhere and god knows bumfuck idaho who knows and, and we'll do a show and and there, nobody heard about it, or it's it's a new venue or something, and and sometimes there won't be more than fifteen or twenty people there, um, but that don't matter. It doesn't can care less, you know. They get exactly the same set. We we know that it's got nothing to do with us. It's not our fault, um, and and we just go out and we give it everything, and and uh, so it doesn't matter if there, if there's twenty people or twenty thousand, they get the same set. 
And that's something that me and Tracy have always had that attitude. You know, a lot of other musicians be like, ah, well, let's just go and wing it. We'll just mail it in tonight. Nobody will notice. They don't care. Mm. We never did that. That's a good attitude. That was a great attitude, yeah. Well, we spoke about the track Speed earlier, but the follow-up single, Christine, is equally uh, wonderful, super, super catchy. And I guess lyrics which tell a story, I would say a very radio-friendly, if such a thing still exists, a very radio-friendly mm. song. Congratulations on Christine. Let's, uh, let's cut to that. Can you give, give us a little, uh, a little background to that before we play it? Well, it was a, um, you know, uh, one of those songs, those, those radio-friendly sort of almost country twangy songs that we come up with every now and then, uh, a lot like Ballad of Jane. You know, there we were um, on the first record, rocking out with, you know, One More Reason to Die and Electric Gypsy and um, Sex Action and Bitches Back. And what do we chart with? We chart with a with a radio-friendly, almost country song um, about a dead girl. Um, and um, it's just the irony um, that we were just trying to be so badass and 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 uh, dangerous, and and that that song ends up being um, the the one that puts us on the map. And very much the same way with Christine, you know, we're we're banging out speed, we're banging out sticky fingers, we're banging out missing piece, and all, all of a sudden there's this this cute, um, simple song. And, and and we didn't really have any lyrics for it, so there was a competition. It was like, well, you know, go write some lyrics. Everybody had a crack at writing some lyrics for it. Um, and Shane Fitzgibbon, our drama won, won the contest with the lyrics. And and so, you know, we're recording it and going over it. And uh, and, and, and so, so I was like, well, who the hell is this about, Shane? Who, who you know, what is this? This is obviously... A, a, a song, a story about two people that have been together through thick and thin, highs and lows. Who, who is it? And mm. Shane goes, can't you tell? And I was like, no. He goes, it's about you and Tracy. <laughs> and sure enough, and, and then listen back to it, it's like, yeah. Yeah, that's so... Um, so that lyrically is, is, is very, very autobiographical. Autobiographical biographical um and and young shane picked up on it wow it's a it's it's a great song thank you it's a bastard to sing live <laughs> it's Mate, too high. The, really it's really really high you know because i went in and i did a low track um at, at, you know most singers do that they're going to do a low one and then do a high one and um you know it's one thing to spend a day in the studio you know, hitting the high notes, but it's a different thing, you know, in, in the middle of a set. And I, I suppose I could get used to it and do it, but we tried it live a couple of times and it almost killed me. So we're just going <laughs> to just leave that one from the album. Well, besides the Australian tour coming up in May, what is in the pipeline for the rest of 2018? Um, lots of touring and um, sometime around the end of summer, beginning of autumn um we'll uh, get back in the studio songs are pretty much complete for the next record for the most part i think we've got like eight or nine i imagine by the time we get to it we'll probably have a dozen um and and uh, come off the road and um start recording so probably have it done by around uh, christmas new years and and start prepping for a new release and it sounds like it's 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 like um a lot like the missing piece this new one mm. it's it's a uh, it's a continuation from there it, it's you know we haven't gone oh well, we just did this great record let's just do a simple blues record and mm. you know uh, we haven't done that it, it, we've carried on with um the same intensity Phil Lewis, every guest on our show gets to choose a song by an Australian band. Something special to them. What would you like to choose and why? Oh, well, I'm thinking I'm seeing my three favourite Aussie bands right now. Um, would it be an Angels? Would it be a Rose Tattoo? Or would it be a Jet? You know, I, 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 is, is, jet, is, is Jet allowed? I mean, all you guys like straight Jet are allowed. School. Jet, jet have reformed and uh, are doing um, Oh, they have. Uh, yeah, absolutely amazing. Love that band. Um 
We'll play I'm going to go with the Angels. I go with the Angels. Okay. Uh, uh, the Ivory Tower. Um, oh. just, just just the lyrics and and just the the way Doc sings it. His delivery. It's it's insidious. You know, he's a, he's a little scary. You know, he's like a a Disney character. Um, more 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 narration than singing in a way. But just just dripping in melody and atmosphere. It's just dark. It's a dark song. All that that whole record. I'm, I'm actually going to put that on when we when we finish when we Wonderful. hang up. I'm going to go and play that right now. So yeah, let's go with that one. The new record is called Missing Peace. I encourage Australian fans to get along to one of the LA Guns gigs when they hit Australia in May. Phil, thanks for your time today. It's a pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you for your support. For Phil Lewis, that was, of course, The Angels with the track Ivory Stairs, which, as many of you will know, is taken from their 1979 album No Exit. So great to have Phil Lewis on the show today, and I hope you all enjoyed hearing that interview just as much I did chatting to him. It goes without saying that his back catalogue of rock and roll is one that is truly amazing, and if the recent LA Guns album The Missing Piece is any indication, it just keeps on getting better and better. LA Guns hit Australian shores in May, so make a note of the following dates and be sure to get along to see the real rock and roll deal. The tour kicks off on the 17th of May in Brisbane at the Woolly Mammoth. Friday the 18th of May, Max Watts in Melbourne, and the following night, which is Saturday the 19th of May, LA Guns take the stage at Max Watts in Sydney. Hope to see some of you at the Sydney date. Folks, it's time to get out of here. AustralianRockShow at gmail.com. That is how you can reach us. Also, please check out our YouTube channel. We are starting to do a few shows online there. Subscribing is the best way you can help us out. You can search for our YouTube channel or simply click on the video when you visit AustralianRockShow.com. You can follow us on Facebook, like us, message us, share the shows around. We would really appreciate it. AustralianRockShow.com is our online home. All the past episodes are there for you to download or stream totally free. How cool is that? We are also on Twitter at Oz Rock Show, AUS Rock Show, if that's your thing. Hear us at places like iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn, and also Mixcloud. And as I've said previously, AustralianRockShow.com is probably the best place to learn more about us and indeed Australia's coolest rock and roll podcast. Don't forget, t-shirts are only 20 bucks plus postage. Grab one, wear one, fight the war against the jive. Thanks once again for tuning in, folks, and you all know the drill by now. If you're listening in whilst driving, turn that volume up and roll the window down so you can educate others. Lifted from their second album titled Cocked and Loaded, here are the mighty LA guns with the song Rip and Tear. Until next time, this is Dennis, out.